Hey everybody, Brian here from quantlabs.net. Welcome to tonight's uh, webinar. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, volatility specific for forecasting in Forex trading or currencies. Um, we've got eight different indicators brought aboard Shalom, who is pretty well, what, who I consider one of the premier guys on the topic. Tonight we're going to do an open discussion about each one and try to give you some resources to use so that you can look into them. And uh, I'm more interested to hear your opinion of each. And uh, the reason I'm doing this is just so that I can implement these results from tonight to be able to implement them into my own uh, trading system. So that's what I'm specifically doing for tonight. And um, I could talk about one of the strategies that I'm working on for the currencies um, and uh, which one I'm using and under what condition. Let me get rid of these, uh, this uh, email client here. Okay, that disappears. Okay, so let's talk about um, Shalom. Uh, Shalom, I'm going to bring up your uh, YouTube channel. If you want to uh, introduce yourself for everybody online, you there, Shalom? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, go ahead, Shalom. Introduce yourself to everybody uh, online so everyone knows who you are. Hey, I'm uh, Sean Benzev. I'm a quantitative trader specializing in volatility trading with VIX and SPX options and also with certain uh, ETFs and ETNs. I have a company called Analytical Kinetics, which, spe which speci specializes in uh, research for intelligent quantitative trading. And it's a good uh, place to, uh, to go to the Facebook page and also the YouTube channel, as uh, Brian has right here. Everything you ever wanted to know about volatility trading, you can find it here or you soon will be able to find it here. So that's the that's the goal of this channel. Um, that's pretty much pretty much what we got. Okay, let, let, let me uh, just add to for Shalom. Uh, we've had you, you've done what, four presentations to the group now? Yes. Four. Okay, um, this particular video here, the very is most popular one, AK Volatility yeah. Training Strategy, and the introduction to volatility trading are two most popular for the specific reason of just that. The commentary I've got from people that have viewed and were part of these um, webinars, people thought was very revolutionary. And yeah. uh, obviously I salute um, Shalom on that because he's, he goes into great detail on that. So if you want to check out these two videos, I would probably definitely check those out. Absolutely. The introduction to volatility trading is the, if you recall, Brian, it's the first webinar that I did for your group. And uh, the 8K volatility trading strategy is just a, a YouTube video, which I did um, a while back. And uh, yeah, it's quite popular. Um, I think that these, uh, these uh, trade, the trading methodologies that I have in these uh, two um, videos, you probably will have a tough time finding it anywhere else on the on the internet. It is really, I think, it's groundbreaking stuff. It's stuff that you don't really find out there. That's what I really wanted to put out is stuff that nobody else is talking about. Right, and um, as I said, this is a pretty informal presentation for Shalom. Uh, yeah. So, over the last few weeks, I've been posting various indicators, and as I said, this is an open discussion for anyone who wants to jump in and just talk about. Um, these eight different indicators that we can use for forecasting uh, forex occurrences. Um, obviously, you can see in this list, some of them are technical, some of them are fairly fundamental, and some of them are quantitative. So let's talk about the first one, um, moving average. Obviously, it's um, a, uh, a very popular um, indicator used throughout technical trading. Um, what's your view of it? Um, Shalom, in terms of just Forex forecasting, I mean, do you find any use for it at all? Uh, first, I want to say yeah. I am not a Forex trader per se. I okay. specialize in SPX and VIX, but I think moving averages, it, they're, all, they're important. I mean, I can tell you what I use for my trading. I, use the, I only use the simple moving average because I think when you start using exponential to weight them, you don't know how much to weight them. In other words, how much are the back days or the back bars relevant compared to the front bars and Obviously, people like to weight the front bars more. That's why they use an exponential. I just use simple moving average, and I assume that everything, every bar within the moving average in, the, in that calculation is equal. 
Um, so I use the uh, the 20 day, the 50, the 20 day for short term trends, the 50 day or 50 bar for intermediate trends, and 100 and 200 uh, bar or day moving simple moving averages for uh, for longer term trends. Um, the problem with moving averages is that it smooths out your signal and it lags. Uh, so you get this lagging effect, and you also get a smoothing e effect, which uh, both of them, it, it creates a time inaccuracy, your timing could be off, and uh, the smoothing itself creates another kind of uh, calculation inaccuracy or lack of accuracy, I should say, within the signal. So it's a simple thing. I, I look at it all the time, but it's not really what I base my trading off of. I just use it to get a general idea of how things are looking in the market. And, and what would you say are the most popular time periods that you use as part of your um, moving averages? Uh, like I just said, I'll, reiterate, I'll uh, say it again in case uh, somebody didn't hear. I use the, the 20 bar, the 50 bar, the 100 bar, and the and the 200 bar. Okay. Now this is the most... Continue. Go ahead, go, go ahead Sean. I, I color code them. If you're going to use them, you want to make sure you have a different color that you use for each one. So for 20 day, I'll use blue for... Uh, for 50 day or 50 bar, I'll use green. So all my charts are consistent. They all have the same color. So I know right away, I don't have to look and see what it is. I can tell by the color what kind of um, moving average it is. And I think it's a really nice thing to do. Uh, that's all I was going to say. Okay. Uh, now, this is where it gets really important because, like I said, um, I'm, I'm looking for everybody's input on this. Um, does anybody else want to add to what Shalom has said or how you guys use um, moving averages? Because this is the important part of the whole webinar. It's just not just Shalom. It's not just my view of it. Uh, anybody else have any particular views of it? Oh, looks like we got a alarm. Is that your end, uh, Shalom? Uh, that's, yeah, that's my uh, okay. that's a fire outside oh, my okay. alarm. Sorry about that. Oh, no, right. it's not your fault. You can't control the streets. <laughs> well, you can't control the fires in New York. Uh, so anybody have any opinions on moving average? Okay. Anybody use moving? Anybody use moving average for uh, forecasting with currencies or uh, forex? This is really important now. I'm curious what you use, Brian. Do you use moving average? What uh, time frames do you use it for? Uh, let me think here. I'm not very good at this. I would use 240 days for a number of working days per year. 20 for the number of working uh, working days per month, and is it 60 for the number of working days in a quarter? Okay. Okay. Um, that's not what I'm using. That's what I'm looking at using those time periods. Anybody else? Wait. Go ahead. I, I, just another question. You're, you're using them consistently across all your charts. You have them set up with the same uh, uh, some moving averages. The same time frames? Uh, yeah, I will eventually, but I'll, I'll explain what I'm doing towards the end of this uh, webinar. But to answer your question, um, I guess you weren't part of the C++ one where um, I have two different time frames where I do analysis both in real time for obviously high speed environments and then a separate one for a view on an end of day weekly and then a monthly view because you get different views different insight of the markets uh, using different time periods but the problem I'm trying to assess is the the way to weight the results of each indicator that's where I struggle so I'm looking at ways to try to, to gauge the importance of each of these indicators and, and figure out the more accurate way of doing it um, we just got a, uh, a remark from, I, I'm sorry, I know it's a Greek name here, Anastasios, the holy grail for me with moving average and such would be to prove a possible acceleration over the years but haven't concluded how to do the analysis. What's your thoughts on that, Shalom? I, I'm not sure what you, what, uh, what uh, is it, Anastasios, are you, uh, I'm sorry, is that a, is that a she? Who no, that could be to? a Greek guy. Is a guy? Possibly. I'm not it's, it's a, a okay, I'm okay, sorry. Okay. I'm not familiar with Greek names. I really apologize. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, so he's, I'm not sure what he's talking about when he says acceleration with moving averages because a moving average 
doesn't really look at acceleration. It doesn't really look at curvature. It's kind of like just a smoothing out. Um, like it's just another line. It's just another line or a curve. But um, I don't. I don't use moving averages to determine acceleration, per se. Um, so I'm not. Sure. I'm, I'm not sure about that. Well, I think what he's referring to. If you were to put a plot of both a daily, weekly, and a monthly chart against each other, you right. will see um, the acceleration of, let's say, if it's if there's upward momentum or downward momentum, and you could see that um, that acceleration related around volume in terms of uh, the return you're getting over that specific time period. So that's what I think he's referring to. Uh, maybe I'm not, but... He's using it in conjunction with the volume symbol moving average right. as well. So right. So when right. you have trend plus volume, you have momentum. Right. And that's what he's calling acceleration. So it's what we would call momentum. Okay. Yeah. Well, if yeah, if you're talking about momentum, yeah, you would need to do simple moving averages on the actual price and then on the volume as well. Absolutely. And maybe some slow stochastics, something like that. So that's stuff that I uh, that I do. Um, in my trading system, I look at stuff like that. So he hasn't. Uh, you haven't concluded how to do it. Well, there are there are books on it. I actually, you should you should probably go through. A good thing for you to look at would be my webinar on uh, uh, high probability technical trading, and I kind of go into uh, how to use what's called um, uh, pups. Pups is uh, is kind of like a a power uptick. It's kind of like an acceleration power uptick. Um, so if you look at that webinar, I think that might give you some ideas on how to go ahead and and and, do, and you know analyze your charts. Do you do you want to do you want to provide a, a link for that uh, specifically in the chat box? Uh, Just pull yeah, up that video. Have, I'll do that. I'll do that. It'll take me a minute to find. No problem. No problem. No problem. Um, go ahead. Okay, uh, let's continue moving along with moving average. Anybody else uh, got some insight on moving averages? If not, we'll go on to Bollinger Band, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about what I'm thinking here. Just so everybody knows, um, I did put up a link on where, where basically you can find this list. Uh, I provided this list. I've also put up a video on it concerning um, the uh, what we're talking about here. So this is the source of, of that list. All right, so Shalom, you just put up your video. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about uh, the Bollinger. Now, the one thing I like about Bollinger, um, not just from a technical, my view of technical trading is it's valid, but uh, there's a lot of retail traders that will just exclusively use it for just predicting a, a, a future trade off of a trading chart or a technical indicator, which I think is kind of dangerous because you're using past data to summarize a potential future movement, which is wrong. That's my view of it. And from talking to a lot of people, that confirms what a lot of professionals do as well. But technical analysis can be used as a way, when you put on an entry, that's fine, but there are numerous ways to calculate your exit, which is difficult. This is where Bollinger is really useful because you can measure your, as one way to confirm your exit using uh, Bollinger. And of course, there's the 30 and 70% rule. So when you are putting on a position, it, depending upon if you buy, sell, or long, short, you can use the opposite way as a form of an exit. That's just my view of it, and I think that's another important um, factor that you can use as a way to measure, a, 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 a way to exit your trade, even around Forex. Uh, what do you think, uh, Shalom, at all? Uh, run that by me one more time. Okay, in a nutshell, you use Bollinger Band as a way to confirm your exit once you put on your 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 entry. So what I'm saying, yeah, I, go ahead. If people do that, the problem with Bollinger is that you're squaring something. It's basically standard deviation bands. So um, it's plus or minus one or multiple uh, standard deviations to get to the band off your current price or okay. last trade price. 
the thing is, when using a standard deviation, you're squaring and then you're taking the square root, so there's some uh, lag in there or smoothing. Um, so uh, you're lagging, so you're going to be your timing is it's 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 going to be slow to respond. So there could be some issues there. So where you have the scalability as opposed to number three, which is true range, which you have less, you don't really have scalability. In other words, you can't compare really to different scales in price, but you're gonna get like a faster reaction. Like ATR generally reacts quicker than, than a standard deviation would to changes. You okay, to well, let, let, let's go back to Bollinger. Under what time periods do you think it could work? Like, like a longer term, like a 30 day or even a week? Uh, for me, I, I would use a 20 day. For the Bollinger. Okay, when you say 20 day, 20 working days or 20 trading days, which is the same as a monthly? Yeah, 20, it's like a month. 20, okay. Yeah, 20 okay. Days. Okay. And would you kind of not use it exclusively, but you would use it potentially as a, as a way to measure an exit just to confirm? Not exclusively? Oh, I, you know, it's one of the things I've played around with in the past. I'm not sure if I'd actually use it in a trade. I would prefer to use the, the ATR okay. or maybe average deviation something else not not use a standard deviation but uh, it's something that certainly you, you it's 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 workable it's certainly workable in a, in a trading system so you know I, I just I'm not a big fan of, of standard deviations per se okay. but and neither is not some Talib I believe but hey you know if it works for you in your trading it's something that traders use so you know you can't you can't discount it yeah okay I, I get you there um Anybody else have any views on uh, Bollinger Bands for specific to currency trading or Forex trading at all? And then we'll talk about the most popular one, which um, uh, I think I'm putting a lot of emphasis on is ATR or Average True Range. Anybody got any views on, um, on the Bollinger Band at all? I'm interested in BBW. Uh, Michael, uh, Bollinger Band Width. Oh, I see. Um, I have no specifics on that. If you want to unmute yourself to expand on that thought. Like, I know you can use it, but um, I guess uh, if you're using it with a third standard 30-day and 70-day, um, I'm not sure uh, too early for me to an analyze it, but in terms of to analyze the significance of the width of it, you have any... Uh, that would depend on how many standard deviations you're moving, uh, you're using, because it's the same number of standard deviations up or down. Oh, I see. So okay. if, it's, if it's one standard deviation, then it's a two standard deviation width, one up and one down. Right. If you use two standard deviations in each direction, so it's a four standard deviation width. Gotcha. Okay. So Mike says uh, Bollinger width suggests a period of price agreement. I guess it comes back to what I use in fundamentals, supply and demand there. I, have to look I, don't know what he, I don't know what he means about price agreement. Do you know what that means? I think what he means is basically on where it's oversold and overbought. Okay. Less All volatility. Right. Yeah. Lower, yeah, less less of a spread, yeah. Okay. So are you suggesting, Michael, when it's wider, there's more volatility and it's, it, it, it's narrower, it's less volatility? I just want to confirm that train of thought. Yeah, of course. When, it, when it's narrower, it's going to be less volatility. Got gotcha. you. Okay. It's, Going to be less makes sense then okay okay uh anybody else have any views on bollinger bands questions on bollinger bands okay let's talk about the etr average true range uh why, why don't you take it away uh shalom you you were leading into the previous uh section there you want me to talk about average true range sure your thoughts of it I think you, you gave a good description. Like I said, I, I like it because I think it responds. The response is quicker as far as timing goes, but it's not scalable in the sense you can't use it to compare different price scales. So, you know, if you're talking about S&P 500 at, at, uh, at, at 1,000 to compare it to, S, uh, you know, S&P 500 at 2,000, since the S&P 500 has a daily range of, uh, you know, Basically, uh, on a daily basis, it'll move at half a percentage point. Uh, sorry, not a half a, half a percentage point, but point half a half a percent, half a percent is what I meant. And right. uh, it's going to be a lot more. At 2,000, it's going to be moving uh, more in terms of uh, numerically more than it would at 1,000, but percentage-wise, it's going to be moving about the same. 
Uh, so, you know, average true range is still good as long as you're not comparing different time, different price scales. Um, I like it. I think it's pretty responsive. Um, it's pretty flexible and all around it's a pretty good thing. A lot of traders use it. It's pretty popular. Well, what's um, it? Keep going. Keep I, I going. Use... Go ahead. No, go ahead, Sean. Finish you up. No, it's the same thing. Instead of, instead of doing, you know, plus, you know, current price plus one standard deviation, current price current price minus one standard deviation to get the van. It would be last uh, last uh, trade price or current price plus ATR, uh, uh, let's say 10 bar, 20 bar, let's say 20 bar ATR, and then uh, price minus uh, ATR 20 bar. Same thing like that. And now you have your ATR bands instead of your Bollinger bands. So under what circumstance do you think ATR would not work? Uh, and you say well, it's not scalable. Yeah, yeah. If you're trying to compare, if you're if you're looking to compare uh, ATR ranges, like when, when the S and P 500 was at a thousand versus when it's at two thousand, then it's not going to compare because it's it's going to be numeric, right? It's not going to be based on percentage. It's going to be the actual range, right? In in uh, in points. I don't think it's. I mean, I guess you can you can convert it to like some kind of percentage. But generally, it's in terms of the average true range is in terms of points. So then it's not comparable. Um, if you wanted to do like an average true range, a percentage true range, um, then that, that would be something a little bit different. Then maybe you could compare it. Um, as far as other things with average true range, I don't know. Uh, it's pretty solid. It's pretty solid. It's just you have to get the bar. You have to know what your time uh, t time horizon is. You have to know, should you be using a 10-day or a 10-bar ATR or a 20-bar ATR? But the same thing with standard deviation. You have to know what you know what your interval should be, what, what the time should be. Okay. Uh, so that takes some, that's probably like a machine learning thing or a statistical analysis kind of thing to know what's best to use. And, and what about, um, could, you, could you do it under a real-time scenario? Yeah, it's a pretty simple ca uh, calculation. You could do it in real time. And what about right. it's just the average of the ranges, so it's yeah, you can absolutely do that in real time. Okay, it's well, not a go, on, go ahead, go ahead. It's not a complex calculation. Like if you were doing uh, co uh, co integration in real time, that would be almost impossible because the calculate it's so calculate it's so intensive as far as uh, calculations go. But for average true range, is a simple calculation. And basically, standard deviation, although it's a little bit more, there's a little bit more of a calculation involved, it can still be done in real time. And what about but ATR? Go, go on. Definitely more so. The ATR is definitely a faster calculation than the standard deviation. All right. Um, I don't know if you saw the point of uh, using ATR as a volatility filter uh, and risk management uh, valid under both scenarios. Uh, I, I don't really think so because the ATR can change very quickly. I don't know how you want to make that's like using standard deviation or variance of like VAR. Should you use VAR as risk management <clears throat> using standard deviation or something? I don't. Uh, I don't think so because it can change very quickly. So in other words, your ATR goes from very low and all of a sudden blows up, and then you were assuming a low ATR because historically that's what it was. So your risk management. Mm, you would have to look at it. You would have to look at very high. You could do it. You'd have to stress test your ATR and use ATRs that were, you know, were, were very high for a very volatile session. In that case, you could use it in risk management. It has to be used intelligently. But yes, you can use it in risk in, in risk management if you're not stupid about it. Okay. Um, I guess ATR, from my point of view, is really good for long term. Um, as I said, the same periods with um, moving average, 20-day, uh, 60-day, and 240 is what I'm working on right now for one of my scripts. And specifically, what where I'm using it overall is um, under, like I said, under two scenarios. Uh, the first one is for long-term positioning uh, with ATR, where I'll do, as I said, a weekly, daily, and a yearly analysis and what I'm looking for overall on the different currency pairs is looking for what are the most volatile at that point and obviously the more volatile the Forex pair is uh, 
the higher probability it's going to uh, uh, be more volatile, and that's where you make your money, um, obviously under volatile scenarios. Now, if you automate your trading and automate your execution, you can definitely use that technique. Um, now, that's one of the big reasons why I'm asking about ATR in a real-time environment. Uh, I'm not sure on that, if that can be uh, applicable. Um, I still got a lot of analysis to do in a real-time environment, but from all my, all these indicators, I think um, I think Shalom also hinted at it, it is a very useful, probably the most diverse and most promising out of all of these indicators, especially, especially for forex trading. Uh, anything you want to add on that, uh, Shalom? No, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Um, Anybody else got any opinions on ATR for both real time or uh, longer term pos uh, positioning or analysis or forecasting? Okay, Michael has got an opinion. I like ATR um, on trending day to sometimes gauge the risk. That's exactly where volatility comes in. It, if today's range extends uh, an ATR, the current move may be limited and stops tighter. Yeah, that's valid too. Any any thoughts on that, Shalom, as well? At all? Sorry, I was... Under sorry, Michael's no, comment. Not. Under Michael's comment. I like ATR and tr trending day. So. Well, I mean, ATR could be a good trigger to get out of a trade, I think. Um, as far as the current move may be limited and stops tighter. Yeah, I don't know if I'd really compare IV to HV. I think they're really different measures of volatility. IV is more sensitive and changes quite much more quickly. Uh, so I, uh, I I know Ernie Chen speaks a lot about risk premium, the IV minus the HV or something like that. Or some kind yeah, of difference. Yeah, that's I, don't use, I, don't, I don't use that. I don't do that type of comparison, but... Like I said, like I will say, if it works for you, use it. It's not something that I use, um, but I would use the ATR as, as as possibly a stop or a also trigger to just exit the trade. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned uh, Ernie Chan's uh, presentation. Is that the same one for when he did with uh, QuantCon at, uh, for Quantopia? I think. Yeah, yeah, and he also did it for you as well. He spoke about risk premium. I remember when you had a uh, a web, he did a webinar for you. A while back. Okay. It might have been a might have been a couple of years ago. I don't remember exactly. Okay. My, Michael seems to agree with you. Uh, James just sent me a private message, which I won't repeat, but I'll just this is for you, James. Um, just email me for anybody else who wants my email. It's always at feedback at uh, quantlabs.net. Um, just send your idea to me, and I'll take a look at it. I got lots on the go, um, but uh, just send that to me if uh, you're interested. All right, um, anybody else got any opinions on the ATR? Looks like uh, Michael agrees with what you're saying as well, uh, Sean. We like agreement. Anybody else? Okay, um, I'm not going to get into much detail on the Garch and uh, the Arima. Uh, I can't even remember, to be honest, but I'll give you my thoughts on both. Um, the GARCH is really meant for quantitative analysis. Uh, it's, uh, if I can't, I cannot remember a lot of it, to be honest. Have you ever tried using GARCH at, at all, um, Shalom? Because that is the crust from what I read under what Ernie's using for his um, way of, of measuring. Uh, yeah, Paul C. also likes it. I spoke to Paul about it. I don't like it. I'm not a fan. I don't use it. Um, it's basically autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity, which means that the variance changes uh, as far as, you know, as the stochastic process goes on. So it indicates like a, a regime change, like different levels of volatility built in to the, to the process. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't use it. I think it's, I, I think it's unnecessary. There's other ways to uh, model regimes, and uh, I have my own way of modeling it. Um, but, you know, uh, I guess some people use it, but yeah. I don't really have a lot to say about it. Yeah. Um, anybody else got any views on it? Uh, I will give you a hint, though. If you are looking for 
uh, Garch analysis in the programming language. Uh, the best language that I've seen that does Garch is under R. Um, R has some great packages for various levels of Garch. Uh, same with Arima as well. I've got numerous um, topics on it from a few years ago when I looked at it. Uh, and I know both can be used under Forex conditions. Um, like I said, I just can't remember it in detail. Uh, anybody else got any views on Garch at all before we move on to the Arima? Anybody? No? Okay. Uh, what's your views on Arima, um, uh, Shalom? Uh, have you ever tried using it? Uh, no, that's another thing I don't use. Um, the thing with the autoregressive stuff is that um, it is kind of t um, computationally intensive uh, to do the computation. Um, it involves like lagged uh, time series, uh, which is not fun for your CPU. That's a lot of work. So um, you have to really understand what it's going to do for you before you spend that much computational power. Um, Economists, I believe, use it, and it's used in forecasting. But the thing is, to forecast things in the market, you really need a good, solid, nonlinear uh, approach. And I don't know that Arima is it. I don't know that it's actually going to accurately model the market. Uh, so it's like a fancy moving average model. It's a much fan fancier version, but I'm not sure if the computational... Um, cost, the additional computational cost is going to be worth it. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, anybody else got any views on uh, both Garch or Arima? Again, these are fairly, not math, but as, as Sean says, they're fairly mathematical intense. I mean, you could paralyze them, uh, where obviously a GPU card can come in handy for that. Um, so there's different ways to alleviate that. Um, Anybody got any questions on that or, or opinion? Now, this one I really like what you did, uh, Shalom. You sent me a research paper about a week ago. I don't know if you remember yeah. this one. Spread volatility. This was an amazing I... research paper. You want to expand on what, what you took away from that? Well, I got to admit, I still have to go through a lot of it, but let's take a uh, look at it real quick. I don't okay. know if you want to bring it up yeah, on yeah. the screen. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, let me I'm going to send it to everyone so everyone will have a copy of it here. Yeah, all, uh, like I said, it's all it's all in this link here if you go into the meetup. Um, so you'll find I'm putting it, it in that as well. So. All right, there it is. Okay, let me just pull it up. So that's that's the research paper, right? Yeah. Okay, let me just pull that up. Paper, I'm not sure if it's a research paper. I mean, it's not that heavy into math. It explains certain things of relationships between spreads and, vol and volume and volatility. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, the spread is a measure of volatility. A wider spread, a wider bid ask denotes more volatility, and a tighter spread is going to denote less volatility, right? No. And as far as. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, sure. High volume, high volume, right, is generally going to go with additional volatility, and low volume tends to go with, with little volatility and, and a lower spread. When there's a higher volume, there's a lot of trades. You don't have the rule of one price. The, the no arbitrage condition breaks down, and you have a lot of trades going at different prices. So you, you, could, you could buy and sell at multiple prices and make money. So if you have, so you'd have, so th th this is what goes together. This is what gets paired together. Narrow spread, low volatility, low volume. Large, uh, widespread, high volatility, high volume, and, and ar more arbitrage conditions as opposed to uh, very few arbitrage conditions when you have lower volume. Now, would you attribute that to just simple supply and demand? Well, I mean, it's just a matter of if you don't have that many trades, you know, you know, you can't really pick at what price you wanna you wanna buy. It's like there's only like one buy seller, you know. You don't really have a choice, right? right. There, there's not a lot of volume. When a lot of people are selling and they're selling quickly in this volatility, there's going to be all kinds of different prices that come in. So you can kind of pick the price that you want to buy or sell at because there's so many of them. There's so much, so many trade, so many prices, so many bid and asks coming in quickly. Yeah. Uh, so, just, just so you know. 
the spread is greater as people come in and rush in to buy or sell, that spread starts to widen as the volume picks up. Okay. Um, Anastasio has come back with a comment. So this fellow, Circuson, released four papers at once, probably trying to make a name for this algorithm. Maybe. I mean, most of these papers, that people don't put them out unless they're trying to market something, either themselves or a company, for sure. There's some agenda, obviously. Yeah. Well, from it doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean you can't learn from it, right? Right, exactly. Um, they're it's not putting this... I mean, I, I like this research paper a lot. It's very I, I do. straightforward. Um, yeah, I wouldn't worry about that at all. Um, as Shalom says, if you can learn from it and it actually works, why wouldn't you want to implement it into your uh, environment? So anybody else have any comments on this one research paper? We've given you the links in the chat box. Anybody? It's cool. Is it, it's kind of well-known TOR. His, his uh, estimate for TOR is the no, average transaction size over the, over the trading volume. That yeah. could be a nice ratio to compute while you're you're doing your trading. Yeah. And that is on page five. Five. It's formula five. Formula five on page five. Uh, formula five, right here. Uh, let me see where you have. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. Okay. I'm sure there's some really good gold nuggets in this thing. Yeah. As always, I thank you very much for supplying that. Oh, absolutely. Every once in a while, if you search enough, you come across true gold on the internet, for sure. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if this qualifies as true gold, but this is certainly an interesting paper, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 from what I saw of it, it looks pretty, in, as you said, interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't print out a lot of papers. I printed out a hard copy of this one. That's how much I liked it. <laughs> yeah. Um, anybody else got any questions on that paper? Okay, um, so it's just one other idea there. So moving on, I think we've already kind of hammered away enough on the ATR volatility future uh, filter and risk management scenarios. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna, oh, where will the paper be shared? Uh, it's already been posted in the chat box, Sh Shazad. Um, it's there at the- uh, Drop in the chat box, I put it in. Yeah, yeah, it's in the SSR9. SSRN.com link. We've already hit that. So Michael asks, what does the spread uh, tell us and in what context? Well, it's kind of a measure of volatility for one thing. All right? Okay. And, uh, well, you know, I'm not a market maker per se. It's, it's used by market it's high frequency traders who do like high frequency market making and since I'm a positional trader my knowledge is really limited but from what I understand when there's a wide spread that's when they can really uh, they can really capitalize and you know they, they they're, they're gonna they're gonna sell at one price they're gonna they're gonna buy at one price and sell at another price and they're gonna pocket the difference since they're making the market so a wider spread means more profit more profitability for market making and a narrow spread means they're getting squeezed. There's not a lot of profit for them to make. Yeah, I think so. It's a volatility, and it's also a measure of, of market maker profitability. They can be much more profitable the wider the spread is. Right. The question is, 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 is watching that spread, and then being able to put on those trades as that spread uh, widens. That's well. That's, I mean, that, they have computers to do that. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean. Um, uh, Michael says he's been looking at the BAC too long, 0 0.01. BAC, is that a security asset? Bank of, was it Bank of America? Uh, wow. Let me just see. It's BOA. BOA is Bank of America. Oh, okay. Only a penny, a penny spread. Okay. Um, Maybe BAC is a symbol? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Maybe. Maybe it's a symbol. I don't remember. Yeah, I'm gonna look it up here. And let's see what it is. BAC Bank of America Corporation. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at a one-day chart. Hmm. Yeah, it's like 0.01. Look at that bid and ask. Well, the last one is 0.01 of a spread. Oh, I see. What you're 
See that right over there? Yeah. 14.9, 14.30. Yeah, got it. But they're selling more than they're bidding. And that would indicate going down, and sure enough, it is going down. Yeah, down and, one point. And, and I'm sure if you look at obviously if you look at the options, the put in the uh, the, the puts in and the uh, I'm always forget my puts in my uh, calls. Obviously, it's another way of doing it as well. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, anybody else got any comments on this paper that was just highlighted here? Thanks to Shalom. Anybody? No. Okay, this last one looks interesting. Uh, the reason I bring this up is um, when you look at uh, or do a search on Forex, so if you do forecasting uh, volatility uh, with uh, Forex, usually the number one article, not in this case, comes up is Oanda. And uh, let me just pull up that link here, what I'm referring to here. Again, uh, this is where you can get all the information uh, of all these uh, different indicators. But the one that I'm interested in is this one right here. And uh, this is pretty easy to do. It's very similar to the ATR. And basically, what Awanda does to measure their... This is done in real time. So, obviously, Awanda is one of the largest brokers. And um, here we're measuring the volatility between, let's say, the Euro, Australian dollar, Australian and Japanese yen. These are your market opportunities right here uh, using this chart. And a lot of it's based upon percentage price movement and high-low movement, similar to uh, the um, ATR. But I just want to bring this up as an opportunity that you could look at to look at pairs and be able to compare uh, which pairs to, to put uh, when you deploy your capital, obviously you want to go with the ones that offer the widest uh, uh, or the highest volatility. Uh, just do that you can maximize your profit in, in those opportunities. So I just want to put that out there. So you can always just do a, a search on, on the order of both these metrics here of the price movement and the high and low, high minus low percentage difference. So I just want to put that out there. Uh, that's just one of the big... Um, metrics that Oanda uses. Anybody got any thoughts on that, or what do you think, uh, Shalom? I know you're not a forex trader, but um, does this sound logical? <laughs> what, uh, what, uh, what do I think about what? As far this as this, this view go. right here, where you use what Oanda does to measure volatility, current current volatility chart in real time. So, if the price movement is wide and not high uh, minus I, low, I mean, if you were to analyze that. And in real time, when you think that would yeah, work? I mean, high minus low could be a measure of volatility. Could be. Okay. Um, you know, so, I mean, I don't think you want to use Oanda's charts per se. I think you might want to own a spreadsheet. No, no, I'm stuff. just using this as a source, as as a, as a, as, a, as inspiration to put and implement in your own system. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. That, definitely. Uh, anybody else got any comments on this uh, idea? I just want to put that out here um, for everybody, uh, just as another metric that you could use. Put I put everything into the chat box. So as I said, we we uh, copy everything that you can off of the uh, chart or off the chat box. Um, and guess what? That's all our metrics. Now the question is, uh, the ones that I would probably use is obviously moving average, Bollinger, ATR. And maybe some form of this, but definitely the first three I'd use. Now, for those that are not familiar um, with the technique that I've uh, architected, um, where basically you have those three metrics in real time, where you analyze the data using uh, Redis on top of, of some kind of concurrent uh, library, like uh, my case, Intel TBB. You can analyze these uh, both in real or all three in real time and get the results. But the question is how do you categorize the weighting of the results in order to forecast that currency pair in real time? So I guess my general question is how would you prioritize the results of each of these three on top of how would you allocate the weighting of them? And that's just a, a general question that I'd have for you uh, if you were to do it in real time. 
any views on that as an answer? Because I do believe that these three are probably the most useful out there for uh, 4x to measure uh, volatility in real time to forecast price movements. Anybody got any opinion on that and how they weight these uh, indicators in real time? Well, moving average is not a measure of volatility. It's a measure of uh, a trend direction, yep. right? So that yep. it's between Bollinger Band and average true range, which okay. are very similar. So, I mean, I would give priority to the average true range. That's right. my opinion. Okay. Over the ball. Well, let, let, let me put it this way. If you were to do average true range, have a metric for your Bollinger where it breaches it, and you know you use both the Bollinger and the moving average to confirm your potential entry, you can still use the average true range and then use the Bollinger combined with the moving average as a way to exit. What, does that make sense, Shalom? I wouldn't use both. I actually use one or one, either two or three. I use one and then I pick either Bollinger Band or average true range and use, it, use them in conjunction. Okay. I think it's too confusing to use two different measures of volatility. Or, uh, or I should say exit points or stuff like that. I think it's better to just either use one and two or use one and three. That's what I would do. That's how I would work. Okay. Okay, and how would you categorize the, the weighting of, of, of the result when you get the combined results back? Well, I, you know, it depends on your on your you know your strat your algorithm. I mean, do you have something that says okay, when moving averages goes below the average true range, uh, the lower average true range uh, line, then you're going to go and buy maybe at that point. Okay, you could have something like that. But that's something that you have to do. You know, that's with machine learning to kind of get an idea of what the score should be. You have to do some empir empirical analysis there. So, okay. you know, off the top of it, uh, I'd say, you know, get your machine learning algorithm, you know, ready and, and have that, have it chew up the numbers and then spit something out as far as what the weighting should be. Okay. But it depends. I mean, every market is different, right? There's different regimes, there's different market conditions. So there's not one size fit all. fits all. It really depends. Well, like so, I said, specific to Forex trading, well, even in forex trading, there's different volatility regimes. You can have low volatility in forex. You can have high volatility. You can have different pairs, different cross pairs, yeah. different market conditions. After the break exit, it's a lot different. The trading is a lot different if you're trading the pound after the break the Brexit or or the euro pound euro something like that or dollar euro. It's a whole different thing than if you're mm. trading it like today, right? So yeah. that's very true. You know, it's different regimes. So okay. different, every regime has to be modeled uh, on its own. Okay. So within the, with the regime, there's a certain modeling, there's a certain pattern. And once you leave that regime, then the old patterns don't apply. Don't try to use them. Then you have, you have your new model for the new regime. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, Michael came back with, uh, um, take a small range of time frames, establish a figure of merit of your trading style, use machine learning to weight each stock in each time frame where they earn higher weights rank the universe of stocks. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing for the Forex pairs. For instance, um, let me just say this. With the ATR, uh, I'll have, uh, I think it's 14 pairs that you get with Bollinger, and then exactly what Michael suggests is to rank the pair based upon the ATR, and the one that shows a higher uh, volatility, obviously, is where I'm gonna probably deploy more capital to those pairs for maximum profit. So I'm kind of, yeah, kind of doing exactly what you're saying, Michael. Thanks for the input. Anybody else have any input on that, on, on, on this scenario that we're talking about with using these first three in combination in real time and how you would measure the uh, trading decision or trading execution? Anybody all? No? Okay. Um, uh, anything you'd like to add, Shalom, on this whole topics that we've talked about today or today, Shalom? No, I, I think we're good. I think this is a nice. Uh, it's a it's a nice range of topics. I mean, I think that uh, not everything here is volatile. Even though you have everything under volatility, moving average is not really a volatility right. indicator. Okay. Um, Arch could be Arima. Not sure. Um, and then the others are related to volatility. So I okay. just want to make that. Clear. But probably the most important thing is to understand the different volatility regimes, 
And the best way to do that is with empirical statistics and machine learning. I, I agree with that because when I studied um, the R process of both Garcia and Arima, uh, what I did was doing a lot of back testing and found that neither of these would be useful for uh, stock or predicting stock market equities, but uh, for both these could be useful for Forex and as Shalom says, they work under specific uh, market periods that you're measuring and uh, depending upon the movement and the velocity of the volatility that you're seeing, each one would have its, uh, as, as Shalom said, would have its own uh, advantage. So there's a lot of programming behind all of these combined. Um, but again, it depends upon your period as well. Um, anybody else got any comments on what was talked about tonight? No? Uh, Michael says he, he agrees. My belief uh, system is that volatility returns to the, to the mean more reliably, more reliable than the price. For sure, that's a uh, trend analysis, I would imagine. Uh, anybody else got any thoughts on what we're talking about tonight? Any ideas, anything I missed on in terms of volatility and measurement for measuring or forecasting Forex using some kind of other technique that I'm missing? Uh, any other people have any other ideas? Uh, okay. Anything else? Well, you've already uh, pretty well said what you needed to say tonight, I guess, right, Shalom? Yeah. Okay, so uh, again, um, check out uh, Shalom's video channel uh, here at Analytic Kinetics. Uh, he's got some very interesting topics. And you have more to come, of course, right, uh, Shalom? Yeah, I have a bunch of exciting webinars to come. I mean, the webinars I did in the past have been some theory, but uh, a lot of application as well, and I think they were pretty useful. Um, I, got, I think people did find them useful, but... Nothing compared to what I have coming up. Now I'm going to really drill down on the application, make it really concrete so you guys can see the numbers, see how the trading actually works. So it's, it's going to be super exciting. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, so yeah. I can't wait. And whenever uh, Shalom gets those prepped, uh, we'll definitely be doing them live. Uh, any other thoughts for tonight outside of what's been presented? As usual, I'll do my comments, criticisms, blah, blah, blah. Anybody? Anybody? Uh, Fractals, how does, how does he use them? Uh, Shalom, if you want to explain that or a particular video you have on that, using fractals? Well, fractals is just basically uh, repeating patterns within the market, self-similar patterns. So there's two types of fractals. There's exact, which do not really appear in the market very often. That's very rare, or robust fractals. Um, the fractals uh, study, um, Elliott Wave, you could look up some books on Elliott Wave theory. Or uh, there's a few good websites. You could go to Elliott Wave. Uh, dot, let me see. Let me find it here. I'm going to post it. Give me yeah. a moment here. I don't use fractals. Um, well. Yeah, I, I have used them in the past. Um, they're kind of a little bit hard to use because the market is a robust fractal, meaning it's not exact. It changes. So you need to do a probability count, and then that gets complicated. And then there's another site called Elliott Fractals. <clears throat> These are the two best sites that I've found as far as fractals per se. But definitely, if you want to do repeating patterns, you can look into statistical reinforcement learning, machine learning, uh, Bayesian inference, things of that nature to kind of get an idea of, of how to get a handle on the different patterns within the market. The only thing I can add for business is using business cycles because if you statistically look at over the last, let's say, 80 years on GDP versus how currency uh, are, 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 are performing against the, the country's uh, uh, GDP, there, there is a lot of repetitive uh, business cycles there. The only problem is to exactly measure them. And that's the only time I can see the use of repetitive data, um, from my point of view, using, of course, fundamental analysis. Right. Um, but everyone's got their own view of it. Fractals, it's not just repetitive, it's a pattern that repeats. Um, it's repeating patterns, but they're not exact patterns. So you have to have some sophisticated algorithms to really, like an AI algorithm or something, mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. really capture them. And this guy, this guy Hank Wernicke, he does the Elliott uh, uh, Fractal set, what he calls it the Wernicke Fractal set. 
and that's all he does. He does fractals on the S&P 500 mini mostly. And he just all day is looking for fractal pairs. So he finds one fractal pair and then he looks for like a, 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 a self-similar pair. And then he tells people when he has like a chat room, a trading ch chat room, and he gives people signals. He tells them when to buy and when to sell. So, well, uh, have, you, have you seen his performance though? Uh, he doesn't post performance. He just posts trades every day. Like he'll say when he got in, when he got out, and how much money he made on the trade. So, but he doesn't do like historical performance. But you can do a trial with him, and, and you'll be able to see as he does his trades. You'll see entry and exit points, and how many how many points he captured. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd be more interested to see what his performance is like. Uh, you no, know, I looked at it. I looked at his trades, and I, I think some of the trades are not possible. I don't know the trades that he reports because I, I I look at them in real time. Like the market never seems to have gotten to where he says it went, so I'm mm. a little puzzled about that. So, yeah. uh, but you, I encourage you if you're interested, try his free trial, and it gives you um, it gives you into his uh, 20 minute delayed chat room, or not chat room, but like it's like a it's like a, a, a 20 minute delayed uh, news feed or whatever or chat feed. And he just goes in and posts the trades with the, like a, a ten to twenty minute delay, and you can see what he did. So, yeah. Any, have, any uh, do you want to finish up on that thought, uh, Sean? Yeah, there's an email that's not so easy to find. Where you send it to? Let me see if I can find it for you guys. Uh, oh yeah, it's over here at the bottom. It's you just yeah. send him. A, yeah, in case you guys can't find it, it's you have to scroll all the way down. You know, I'll, I'll, it you, you let me know where I need to go. All the way to the bottom. There it is. I just posted it. Oh, it's okay. registered at ElliotFractals.com, yeah. and you just say, I'd like a free trial. Yeah, right free here. Trial. I guess free trial or email. It's a 30-day free trial. They give you a password, and you can go in, and you can see what they're doing. Right. Um, anybody else got any questions? Uh, probably the next set of topics I'm going to be covering when it comes to currency trading is uh, more fundamental analysis on looking at the uh, economic drivers, news impact drivers that can in, in impact the currency uh, of a nation. And then when you compare that against another nation and then be able to predict or forecast uh, the, the currency pair price movement. So I want to do another webinar around that topic just to see what you think are important in terms of uh, Forex drivers um, for future uh, currency pair uh, price movements. So I'm definitely going to do that in the next week or so. We can do the same thing with uh, Shalom if he's wanting to be part of that as well. Um, anybody else got any final thoughts on tonight? Questions, comments, blah, 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 blah. Anybody? No? Okay. Uh, one last announcement just so everybody knows. Um, let me just get rid of something here. Uh, Okay, let me just go to, um, if you go to my blog here at Quant Labs, I just want to make a big announcement here. Um, right now, my Quant Lee, uh, if you bought a one-year uh, membership, uh, we, we currently have it at $2,400 savings. It's a total three-year term. Uh, as of this Wednesday, I'm going to reduce it, or after Wednesday, I'll be reducing it down to uh, $1,200 or... Um, basically down to uh, one year. So you're going to miss out on $1,200 savings if you're interested in what I do. So I'll give you that link if you're interested. Um, so put out an email on that uh, earlier today. All right. So thanks again, Shalom, for all that. No very, problem. Very valuable right. information. Um, before parting words, anybody got any questions or comments? We'll do it going once, twice, three times. If not, we will shut her down. No problem, Tristan. Thanks for coming aboard. I know you had some questions and stuff. If you took away some new stuff from this. Anybody else? Questions? Comments? Go on once. Go on twice. Go on three times. Well, that took us one hour. I appreciate it exactly. Um, again, thanks again yeah. for... Was that Sean? Perfect. With one hour. I think yeah. that's the way a webinar should be. Well, I figure most people stick around for about an hour and a half. Beyond that, they'll start dropping off. No problem, Marius. Uh, well, I guess we're going to pretty well uh, shut her down. Tristan agrees with, I guess, the time period for these things. 
But again, thanks again, guys. Uh, hopefully you're uh, on the meetup or the Facebook group. Um, and I'll put up the video, uh, the playback tonight, uh, once it's complete and posted on YouTube on this. Again, thanks again for Shalom uh, doing this. I, I don't think I could even do three quarters of this without him. <laughs> you know what I mean? His wisdom is very valuable around wow. here. Okay, so I'm going to yep. shut, shut her down now. And uh, again, thanks again. Uh, hopefully I'll see you on the next uh, webinar. Yeah, thanks again, Shalom. No problem, Brian. Okay. Take care. Okay, everybody have a good day, good night, wherever you are. Over and out. Later.